friends, today's program is about three ages of blue, indigo, Prussian blue, and Taylor blue. Let's start with Prussian blue, although in history it would be the second one after indigo. Yeah, Prussian blue was invented in the 18th century. In the very first part of that century, it's considered the first modern blue, although it's, it's already about 300 years old. Whereas the indigo at the oldest one and still count as a natural. The third one, thalo blue, is the modern color. And, and that was invented in the 20th century. And you're probably wondering, why did we choose this three specifically? You will understand a little bit later. Here's the indexes for three of them. Let's start with Prussian blue. Like always, we will mix with just simple linseed oil, but we wanted to show you behavior of the every each of the color. Prussian blue is a pigment that was made originally from ox blood. Today, of course, they don't use ox blood. They start off with uh, ferrocyanide. And it is an artificial pigment. Of the three, the only one that's natural is the indigo, which is the oldest, a very ancient pigment. I want you to notice how much oil Prussian blue takes. It does have very small particles, although you can see it's almost look like it's huge particles, but it's because of the... The particles are clumping together into aggregates and agglomerates, and this is why Mulling it or grinding it in like a triple roll mill is essential to make a very smooth paste. When we grind our Prussian blue, we probably grind six to seven times. And that's on a uh, mechanical mill. So doing this with a molar is very difficult to achieve its smoothness. Here you can see the difference with uh, the color that's been milled on a triple roll mill many times. And you can see the difference. You see how smooth it is. It's very hard to get this into a smooth dispersion just by hand mulling. On another hand, indigo, which is again, it's natural, how George said, and it's MB1. So yes, natural blue one. And so it's, a, it's actually a dye from the indigoferrin plant, and there's different species of that plant. But because it doesn't dissolve readily in oil, it is considered a pigment. And that's the difference between dyes and pigments, is that the pigment will not dissolve in the medium in which it's placed. Indigo takes a lot of oil too. And it's almost feel like, feels like you are grinding the sand. It has, probably the biggest particles what you can uh, fill between three of them but you will see in second it's basically crumbling yeah so the particles are reduced and again it's because the smallest particles are aggregating they're agglomerating and when we disperse it with a molar or a mill we get it into a much smoother paste Compared to Prussian blue, indigo is more opaque and you can see on the plate. You can see that it obscures what's underneath. Let's talk about thalo blue. And that one, you probably don't want even to breathe while you, you're grinding this color. It's not considered toxic, but it, it's so fine, very much like Prussian blue. Yes. That the particles fly everywhere with just the slightest amount of air drifting through. Expect everything will be blue after grinding that color. Yeah. In our factory, many things are become blue because the, the pigment drifts everywhere. But it's a fantastic color. It has very high tinting strength. It is a modern color of the 20th century, phthalo cyanine blue, which has a copper molecule inside in a organic chemical formula. 
So it's one of the modern blues that have been invented since the end of the 19th century. Again, not easy to grind because of the particle size, very small. And that's something people don't realize. The smaller the particle, the more difficult it is to grind. It seems counterintuitive, but that's because there's more surface area on the particles. We don't compare that to the colors, uh, to the oil colors, because we don't make them. Now, let's like always mix our colors with two whites. And in this case, we choose Velasquez medium. Which is not a white, but it is an extender pigment that looks whitish. It's the one at the top there. And because it actually will enhance the transparency of the color, as you'll see here. But we wanted to show you true color because it's basically where what we are doing now, making this color more transparent, but without added oil. Which is a great way for glazing. Yes. And we've covered that in another video about the use of extender pigments and another one where paste pigments are great for glazing and impasto which is what this medium is designed for. On the left side, we will mix with lead white. And even based on video now, because this we, uh, I just ground this color and you still can see the particles. It will... Well, these agglomerates and they will affect the color. They won't have as high tinting strength until they're completely dispersed. It will scatter light. Not as much as fine particles though. Finer particles scatter light more because there's more surfaces upon which light interacts. The and that's why larger particles are actually less opaque than small particle pigments. If you take the same pigment and you reduce it to a smaller size, you actually get greater transparency, greater tint strength. And that's why it's so important to disperse the small particles at very well to get the maximum amount of tinting strength. Look at that. It almost feels like you mix in different pigment. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And, and this is what many artists don't realize, the difference between the whites and even something like like the Velasquez medium, which has chalk in it, which gives it greater transparency. So it's quite amazing the color range we can get just from the same pigment. Now let's talk about indigo. And now I will talk why we choose three, looks like completely different colors. But, if you will look today of the back of the tube, any of your indigo from other companies, you will find mixtures most likely three pigments and one of them will be phthalo blue. But in many cases, it will be mixtures of three colors. Mm -hmm. It will be Many of these mixtures have something like a quinacrinone violet. Some have a lamp black or an ivory black to get that very dark, smoky color that you're seeing here. This is the genuine indigo, folks. This is, and of course, we do understand that the light fastness of this particular pigment is not as good as, of course, perhaps some of the mixtures, but you will not find that kind of color. Look at this smoky yeah, blue. Yeah, beautiful smoky colors, smoky blue. And with the lead white, you can see that it becomes a very cold gray. And of course, if you will watch our other programs where we're talking about mixture of the colors, and sometimes when you buy the mixture and you don't understand what is in the tube, so you don't even understand how come one mixture is bringing you towards warm or towards cool side and then you are struggling with that. So we just decided to show you through Genuine indigo. Yes. Yeah, exactly. 
Now watch what happens when we stay you titanium. titanium. And this is amazing. Again, look at the contrast between the lead white and the titanium mixtures of indigo. And again, watch another program because we cover in many programs about lead white and titanium where titanium is cool color and lead white is warm white. That's why we have that difference. And you can see how that titanium white overpowers the color so quickly. Now back to phthalo blue. So this is the probably one of the most powerful blue used by every company in the world right now. And you will see how many beautiful gradations you can make with one color. But you notice here how this Velasquez medium, again, which is calcite, so it does, it's not a white. You can see how it can hardly make a dent in that color unless you put a lot of it there. That's what's very interesting about using calcite or other types of extender pigments as, as a substitute for a white in some mixtures. White explains when almost no company in the world using phthalo blue without additives and fillers. So now you can notice here at the very top with the lead white, you can see that it's grayish, but that's because just by hand mulling, you really can't get a smooth paste. You can't disperse the pigment properly. And so it creates this diffuse reflection, which looks very matte and makes the color look grayish, but it isn't. It's an illusion created by that kind of reflection. Back to mixing, what I found, if you will mix uh, phthalo blue with black, you almost can reach the Prussian blue. Prussian blue is actually a much darker, darker. Uh, color in that respect. So it's, it's a beautiful color. It has, and, uh, and it's why it's been so popular in the past couple hundred years. And again, it's why phthalo blue is used with many of your mixtures. And if you will look on the back of the tubes and so with many of your yellows, it will become beautiful greens. And it's in a lot of your king's blue colors too. The phthalo blue? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. I thought some of them used ultramarine too. Some right? of them, yeah. yes. So those are those color mixtures there. Same like with indigos, some of the companies are using ultramarine. In the tube, yes. yes. Yeah, that's true. We just want to show you how they will be mixed all together. Here. Yeah, the simple comparison here with the three colors. You can see how dark the Prussian blue is. And of course, indigo looks absolutely black. It is a very dark, smoky, grayish blue, which has so much potential there. And in other places, we will talk about how to preserve that color longer because it is not incredibly light fast, but it was used in many paintings in history. Thank you very much to being with us. Please like this program. And subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Bye, Bye. now.